to you, Professor Srikant Dator, uh, who I met uh, since, he, since he published uh, this work. Uh, there are many challenges uh, being published to our industry at the current time, and uh, I've read a lot of them. And this one stood out for me for its, uh, for its salience, for its uh, uh, directness, its methodology, and most especially for its optimism about the future of our, of our of the work we do, the importance of the work we do, and for its, for its future and its need, its potential in the current environment. Um, I first met Patrick, the third author on the book, Patrick Cullen, and when I first met Patrick, I was very critical of certain aspects of the book. And he took that back to, to David and Srikant, who could have responded with, you know, what does he know, and uh, a certain amount of defensiveness. Instead, you know, we're extraordinarily embracing you know, telephone calls to elaborate, and then an invitation to be part of a forum uh, where they pre presented these ideas to deans of management schools. And as a consequence of the conversations that took place there, my respect for all three of them has, has just grown uh, by leaps. And, I won't uh, bother you with all of the details of Mr. Hunt's uh, credentials and background. It's enough really to say that uh, two things about him. One of them is that he's currently a Harvard Business School professor. The other one is the first question was, is it all right if I take off my jacket? <laughs> <laughs> I was about to ask if I could take off my tie as well, but then uh, no. I figured uh, I knew the answer to that question, so I didn't. Uh, uh, even us. So thank you very much, uh, Fred, for your kind words. Uh, thank you very much for uh, uh, having me uh, in your midst. As I have uh, mentioned to Fred many times as a result of all the conversations we've had, and as I was mentioning to uh, Dean Mohan earlier, uh, I'm here as much to talk about the ideas in rethinking the MBA as to learn from you about uh, many of the things that you've already done that I'm going to be uh, speaking about. So many of these initiatives have already occurred here, and uh, I'm just as eager to find out how they're going and uh, what, it, what else do we need to do in terms of uh, uh, these things taking root, uh, because I'm definitely very passionate about some of the changes that we talk about, as you will see as I go through the presentation, uh, but well aware that uh, implementing them is not a snap. It's not... Uh, it's not something that will happen automatically. And, uh, but I have to say that I've been very heartened up to this point, just by way of introduction, uh, uh, as a result of the, the reception that the book has received up to this point. A um, uh, great deal of interest in uh, US business schools and trying to rethink what's going on in uh, business education. Uh, but equally interesting, uh, the reaction uh, in the rest of the world, uh, the two data points I'll give you just by way of, uh, uh, you know, I think they, they both indicate something. Uh, the Indian government, of course, uh, got to see the book when it first came out, and so I've actually just come back from four months working in India on trying to revamp business education in the major uh, Indian schools. Uh, they would like to do it across all 4,000, as some of you may or may not know, that uh, there are 4,000 uh, 200 schools in, in, the, in, in India as of the time that I last looked because I've uh, made this mistake in India many times. I say, okay, there are 4,200 schools. Someone puts up their hand. They said, Shrikant, when did you look at the data? And I say, three months ago. Well, they said, now the number is 4,500. So, uh, but the last time I looked, it was around there. Uh, and then the other interesting thing that happened to us was that we had very early requests from the Chinese to get the book uh, translated into... Uh, into Chinese, and uh, uh, we said, you know, we didn't think this was possible in the course of a year uh, from the time the book came out, and the Chinese said, we only want to have it done if it can be done in the course of a year. We don't want to be waiting a few years for this. So right before I came here, I got my copy of the Chinese translation of Rethinking the MBA. I have no idea how well translated it is, since I have no knowledge of Chinese, but my publishers tell me that it has been done. So it's gratifying to look at the interest uh, uh, elsewhere. Uh, and for reasons that I'll argue, I hope uh, uh, you know, more schools will at least think about uh, what it is. I should say at the outset, although I'll go through a number of different uh, 
ideas that are in the book, several of you are familiar with them, I'm, I'm sure, from the work that's gone on at this school. We do not claim that every school should do everything that's been, uh, uh, that uh, is described in the book. Schools should pick and choose based on their own strategies. They won't do it the same way. So we like to think of the book more as a compass than a road map. It sort of directs in which direction uh, we think uh, business education ought to go, but it's by no means a road map. It doesn't say everyone has to do it in a particular way or do the particular things that uh, we describe. Happy to be interrupted at any point in time as I go through the presentation, so please uh, don't hesitate to ask. We'll try and leave a few minutes for questions afterwards, and I believe Fred's left a little bit of time in the afternoon for those of you wanting to get into more details to uh, get together and chat. So I very much look forward uh, to this uh, entire day. Let me say a word about how the project got started. There's a little in the book, but uh, I think it's useful to provide some context. Uh, uh, so this is about uh, fall of uh, 2006, and Harvard Business School is celebrating its centennial in 2008. It's founded in 1908. Um, and of course, as uh, all schools do, when you reach milestones like that, it, as our dean at the time, uh, uh, said only half jokingly, you know, a centennial is one of those events that does actually only occur once every hundred years. We say lots of other events only occur once every hundred years, but a centennial certainly occurs only once every hundred years. So we should celebrate, and it was a matter of great celebration. Any school that has survived that long and uh, ought to celebrate uh, just that accomplishment. But there was a great deal of interest on the part of faculty to say, that's great, but uh, you know, what about the future? And what will people writing the history of management education 20 years from now, 30 years from now, say of our time as we were going through this celebration? And uh, for those of you who are familiar with the history, 1908 is just after the liquidity crisis of 1907. So the school was, in fact, founded right after one of these major uh, financial crises. And so here's 2006, and at this time, the world looks like it's completely fantastic. You know, it's like every lot of growth, uh, lots of countries coming into the market economy. The demand for managers couldn't be greater as the market economies are expanding. So this looks like it's going to be a terrific celebration. Uh, and so we said, okay, we look at this. The idea at the time was only to look at it for Harvard Business School, no book no nothing, just David Garvin and I, at that time Patrick Cullen hadn't joined us, were going to look at business education and what it meant for Harvard Business School, period. Nothing beyond that. It was a very narrow, well-defined, you know, complicated topic. Anytime you're looking at business education, it's a complicated topic, but not, you know, no idea of doing any of the kind of work we eventually ended up doing. And, but one of the early decisions David and I made was that we weren't going to look inside. That made it not very interesting. We wanted to look outside. We wanted to see what are other schools doing, what's happening in the, in the whole uh, aspect of management education. Um, uh, how, how are other schools looking at management education and what are they doing? And so uh, we contacted a number of schools and said, you know, we are looking at this uh, work and would you, you know, would we, could, could we talk to you? At that time, we hadn't quite raised the issue that we'd want to write cases on them. That came a little bit, uh, came a little bit later. But it's just, just talk to you. Just find out what are you doing? What is the most innovative things you've done? What are the challenges you're facing? What are you hearing from your uh, 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 schools and your alumni and your faculty and you know the society? What 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 are the challenges? And so, uh, just just we are in the process of doing this. So would like to just talk to you. What amazed us was the amount of enthusiasm and interest we received from these schools as we approached them. I mean, they were eager that we expand our study. They were eager that uh, you know, we do this in a much more uh, broader, deeper, uh, uh, you know, in-depth way than what we had ever imagined we wanted to do. And they said, you know, we'll share with you everything. We'll tell you everything. We said, how about by that time we were bold enough to ask, could we write cases on you? And they said, yeah, we'll be happy to allow you to do that as well with one condition. And the condition was that once the work was done, 
uh, we had to hold a, a colloquium at Harvard Business School to share all our findings. Obviously, they didn't want to give us data that would only be beneficial to Harvard Business School. They thought we should do this. And once we shared it, and they trusted that we would do that uh, honestly and with integrity, then every school could do what it wanted. And again, no thought that we will write a book, nothing of the kind. Just wanted to say, OK, uh, this would be a great uh, opportunity for us to talk about what's happening in the profession, in the, uh, in the business of business education at large. And so a uh, good opportunity to do that, and that was it. When we met in May of 2008, uh, certainly from the work that, uh, uh, that uh, David and Patrick and I had already done, talked to a very large number of executives at that point. Few in-depth interviews, but by that time, we were in the thousands of people that we had reached. Again, few in-depth things with respect to students, but we had reached you know, thousands of students and very large numbers of faculty. So we had a fairly good perspective from what people were generally feeling about what's happening in business education. We did the symposium, and then we did the, uh, uh, did the symposium for Harvard Business School. So first was the symposium for all the schools, and then a separate symposium for our own faculty to, in, as part of the centennial celebrations. Uh, and then, of course, September 15th uh, happens, and Lehman goes, and the whole uh, collapse of the financial system begins to sort of rear its head. And uh, uh, we say, my goodness, you know, we've collected all this data two years prior to the crisis. We were already beginning to see in 2007 some signs that there were some problems and tensions as we were looking at it, but nothing of the magnitude that we saw. And so we said, there's no alternative but to go back and redo, the, redo a lot of the work because this is just such a monumental event that has occurred that we ought to go back and redo uh, uh, this work. So we went back in 2008 to redo it. And it's only at that time that we felt comfortable that you know, there was enough at that point that uh, documenting it in some way would be a worthwhile activity. And so that led to the book being published in, uh, uh, in uh, April, May of 2010. So that's uh, the four-year journey through, the, uh, through rethinking the MBA, and I'll just get to a few of the highlights as I, as I go through the, uh, the presentation, uh, giving you a sense about what, what was going on uh, around that time. I'll skip some of these uh, over, uh, the slides. They'll be uh, in there. But here's the first set of data we looked at. Uh, 2000 to 2008, what's happening at, uh, at the top US MBA programs? Again, we're often asked, uh, why did we only look at the top 36 or 40 schools? We didn't have many more resources to go beyond that is the, is the only correct answer. Uh, but we also thought that if you're going to see any change occurring in business education, that is likely to take root. We're likely to see it in this population. That is, these are the schools that if they did something, if they could send something, uh, you know, uh, if, they, if these schools really took seriously the fact that there was a issue or a concern, then maybe something will happen. And if they didn't, you know, nothing, nothing would. And so, uh, again, we didn't, we just looked at all the surveys, typically composite number. We don't actually rank any schools. This is just the set that we uh, looked at among those, uh, among the top uh, 40 schools to get a sense about what's happening. I should say that we had talked to a number of schools that were not in our sample. And we had already begun to see this problem about decline in enrollments in the full-time MBA program from schools yes, between past the top 50, certainly past the top 100. There you could clearly see substantial declines going on. What we hadn't anticipated is how bad that situation was for the uh, schools inside the top 40. That we had not anticipated. And that certainly to us was a surprise as we began looking at the data. So this is the data that I'm just referring to. That as you look at the schools in other than the top, or what we call here the 14, 15 schools, uh, again, there's no particular ranking, but we look at a composite ranking and just take that as the ranking of the, uh, put that in the, on the scale from 1 to 36. Other than those, you could be a top 20 school and see substantial declines in your enrollment in the full-time uh, uh, program. And certainly after that, you see substantial declines. Now, it's not a surprise to any of us familiar with how our 
business works that if you're going to see a decline, you're going to see a substantial decline. No uh, school or dean or uh, faculty is going to say, okay, let's just cut every class down by three or five percent because all our costs then are roughly the same, the revenues are going down, so nobody is going to do that. So if you're going to cut, you're going to cut sections. So what you're seeing here is cutting of sections. If you see a 25% decline, it's because someone had four sections and they're now going down to three. If you see a 33% decline, and someone had three sections and you're going down to two. And indeed, when you see a 50% decline, you see someone having two sections going down to one. Simply proud schools simply could not fill a class. And so now the debate or tension was how should we what should we do when we don't have the, 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 the students uh, coming into our programs? And the reaction was, you know, you can either take in much lower quality and that might over, or uh, soon enough perhaps, as early as the recruiting season starts, people saying, geez, these are not the kind of quality of people we expected or wanted, or you have to just cut your classes. And of course, where it got substituted was in executive MBA programs at that time as the boom was there. Now, of course, as you probably know from the data looking at uh, what's happened post-2009 and 10, even executive MBA programs are seeing fairly substantial declines. But at that time, it was, it was going well. And you we can try and control for the cyclicality, seasonality, all the usual controls, number of applications. So I'm not going into all the technical details of the, of the research uh, uh, approaches. All right, so now that got us thinking what is the problem? Why, by the way, Europe, similar sorts of situations. What is the problem? Why is this happening? What are we hearing from a lot of the people that uh, uh, we spoke to about uh, the business education and, and where it's going? And I won't go through all the things, but there were, in our minds, two or three things that kept coming back at us in a, in a very big way. And I'll just say that uh, uh, just briefly, and, and, and those of you familiar with the book know about the details behind these three statements. First, that lots of concern from the recruiters and executives and society and deans about the value added of the MBA degree. Are we able to deliver students who can get things done in the way in which we expect that they would get things done when they leave our program. So first big headline thing we got, and this came up repeatedly. It didn't matter who we were talking to and what they kept saying, what is the value added of the MBA degree? Second, which is also very interesting on the other side of this uh, equation, very good schools. So I, I'll just name Stanford as one because they were very open about it and honest about it. And in our case study, this is in appearing in spades. So there's no students are very disengaged with the academic curriculum, even at a place like Stanford. So and there are many other schools that are in that category, but Stanford I can say I can name because it's in the case study and it is something that uh, you know was clearly motivating the big changes that they made in their, uh, in their uh, MBA curriculum. So very concerned about student engagement. So recruiters not happy with what they're getting, students disengaged. And then on the faculty side, this big tension or pressure between you know, the kind of research that is being done and the kind of research that uh, executives would like to see. So when we asked people, how much of business school research are you really engaging in other than a few areas? a lot of concern on the part of the executives that they don't find much of the research that we're doing to be as helpful as they might have wanted it to be. So these were three big facts that kept coming back at us, you know, time and time again. And I said, okay, this looks like there's something at least for us to uh, think about as we uh, pursue this uh, research. What we ended up concluding, just to give you the conclusion first, and then I'll try and go through a couple of the uh, things, was that I should go back here and set it up a little bit. One of the things that, of course, we worried about is why is it that these schools are somewhat insulated from this problem? Why is it that there are a few schools that are insulated from the generally big declines that we're seeing once you leave school number 15. And as we began 
pouring through, and as I said, this is really a, uh, an effort on the part of everybody in, the, in, in business schools to kind of work with us on this data. So there was no hiding back. So we wanted, in this particular instance, to understand this problem. We wanted to look at placement data, because we said, unless we look at placement data, it's very hard to figure out where, in fact, uh, these things are, what's going on. And as we looked at placement data, as you might not find surprising, of course, because this is probably well known at that time, we had a hypothesis, but you, once you look at the data, it's so clear that these schools are insulated because of the number of their graduates that go into two industries, financial services and consulting. It turns out that if you look at where graduates of business schools go, once you leave the top 15, the number of students going into those two professions declines very fast and very sharply. So, but if you look at those schools, and the numbers I'm talking about, at least in the years we were looking at it, because this is the boom, the financial uh, services boom occurring, I mean, it can go up as much as 75%, 80% is going into, so imagine what the differences are. You're looking at 75, 80% going into those two industries in some schools, and less than 10% in the others. And that's going to cause, of course, a big decline. Of course, it began raising for us a different question as to whether, in fact, you know, if I look at medicine and I say, you know, what does a, what does a person trained in a medical school deal with if they go to one of the top schools and go to one of the schools that are not rated so highly? You know, now you're still seeing a patient. You're still doing similar kinds of activities. Leave the research folks uh, aside. But here it seemed to us that Perhaps the kind of things that are going on at the, what the, school, the folks at the top schools are doing when they go into these professions, and what's happening in the rest of the industry, there might be a, a mismatch. So for instance, if I'm looking at financial services and consulting, the skills that I really want in terms of analytics, the skills that I really want in terms of the knowledge or the knowing part, very high, because that's what these folks are. But are they really working on getting a lot of things done? Are they really leading a lot of teams? Are they really leading large groups of people? That's a very different, uh, very different story compared to what would happen if students went into other aspects of management. And so that got us thinking, you know, is the kind of thing that we're doing in these programs uh, uh, sort of well suited across the entire board. Now, of course, by this time, there's also a lot of angst on the part of faculty members, on the parts of deans, that are we sending too many people into one set of, uh, into one a couple of industries compared to everything. And of course, we all know the reasons why, the rewards that were there in those industries. You know, we, we know the explanations, but just generally, if we're training people, are we, should we be sending them there? And, you know, lots of schools tried many different things to change that balance with no avail, you know, we got rid of GMAT at Harvard, and we got tried to take more people from uh, engineering. It didn't matter what you did, you know. Eventually, people would find themselves into uh, uh, into those uh, into those jobs, and so. But it is not as though everyone was completely happy with it. So, of course, there was concern even at the top schools about whether that's a good mix. But at least from a placement point of view, at least from a job point of view, at least from getting people to come into your programs. Not a problem there because of this particular boom that's occurring in financial services. Um, by the way, it's interesting as a complete sidelight. It's in a small footnote in our uh, uh, in our uh, in the book, but it's a, a, often for an NBER paper. But for those of you who uh, would would like to see, it's very interesting. So someone pointed out to us that uh, if you look at uh, uh, this paper, it shows salaries from 1909 to 2009 in various professions, so each by decade. You know, so you look at teachers, what were they paid in 1909, and it's a nice little slope, and you look at doctors, they paid a little bit higher, and the slope might be a little different, and you know, they're all track engineers, architects, accountants, you can kind of go through it. And then you look at finance. You look at finance, and you see 1909 to the early periods, it sort of tracks. And then 1920s, it goes way off the charts, you know, relative to where the line is. And then, of course, once the Great Depression hits, then they come back again, and it stays. And then the next time it really goes off the charts is in the mid-'90s period. So at least the authors of that piece are referring to you know, leading indicators of uh, economic trouble coming from, just look at 
you know, how much these uh, salaries uh, change. I, I always worry about causation and uh, correlation here, and, but there's, of course, some, uh, some aspect of that. But that's what was going on with respect to this insulation of this top. They were sending a lot of people into an industry that was booming at the time, and so they were not feeling the pinch, but everybody else was. People were still thinking, is this a good thing or not a good thing? But at least from the point of view of the student coming in and where they were going for their jobs, not a problem. So as we began looking at this problem and, and started thinking about what was it and what were we hearing from the executives, were of course some were from this industry, but a large number were from other industries, entrepreneurs, you know, lots of other folks. And it basically ended up coming down to these three things, and that's the structure, those of us who are familiar with the work and leadership in many different areas. You know, the US Army uses this kind of model, so the model is not, of course, us, but we thought it was a useful way to think about what the dimensions of the problem were. And so we ended up putting it down into those three frames and basically arguing, so knowing facts, framework, theories, we probably do a pretty good job. You know, we've got lots of them. We've, in fact, the problem might be on the other side. Do we understand what the limitations are of the frameworks and theories that we teach? Because, uh, uh, you know, sometimes we don't fully articulate. We understand from looking at the research that uh, any, anything that we state is only true based on a whole range of assumptions and you know, so on, uh, context and all the rest of it. By the time you teach it, you're perhaps not articulating all of those in as much detail as you should, and so then does it get misapplied? That's a, a, a genuine concern. We do uh, cite uh, von Hayek on this in his uh, Nobel Prize winning talk on the pretense of knowledge and the fact that you know, in the social sciences we can't take knowledge just as given, but the fact that as you think about knowledge in the social sciences, it's context dependent, it's contingent, it's based on human intentions, intuition. So all of this has to be thought through, but in any case, at least we don't, we are, we are not, uh, besides that uh, point, we don't, we, we feel that certainly from the 19, after the Carnegie uh, Corporation and Ford Foundation reports, business education did from its research standpoint good, and we're, we continue to believe that that should, uh, that should happen. Uh, it's a good thing that that happened, and it's a good thing that we're doing it. The concern is one of balance, so everything here now is uh, now on balance. Now, the one thing that was very striking, and we didn't know where to put it, so we have sort of clubbed it under there. Many will tell me that it should belong in some of the other categories, and I'm not particular about the categorization. But if one distinguished the knowing part from the thinking part, that, we have to say, we do not see from the interviews we did and the data we got that people were very happy about our students' abilities to think. Either think critically, so, and I'll go through a couple of those examples now. Think integratively, uh, you're able to, you know, hold two different concepts in your head, not get confused. Think globally, can you really appreciate what it is to be across different uh, cultures? Are we doing a good job there? Or to think innovatively. So those four important thinking skills. Now, Everyone says, oh, Shrikant, but that also applies in all sorts of other uh, educational endeavors, and that's all true. Our focus was, of course, what's happening inside business schools. Is that something that we're doing? And certainly our feeling from a lot of the interviews, and, and as you're seeing some of the changes that are occurring in these curriculum, they're trying to address those uh, areas. I think on all those dimensions of thinking skills, critical thinking, integrative thinking, global thinking, and innovative thinking, um, much less in terms of what we do. We kind of try to give them things in, in frameworks that we are very comfortable with given how the functions have developed. And so once that has happened, uh, we're good there, but not so good in, in these four dimensions that I just described. An even bigger problem was on what we ended up talking about is the knowing doing gap that what our students know from what our executives were telling us and what they can actually do, there's a huge gap. And I'll take the simplest example from my uh, own work in management control systems and management accounting. If I look at something like break even, of course, you know, you can, I can give you all the data in a simple problem and you can certainly calculate a break even 
uh, in, a, in a problem that I give you. But how about now you go to a company and say, you know, I'm trying to think about cost volume profit, you know, if this happens, what will happen? I mean, our students don't even know where to start because, you, of course, you have, don't have a good sense about what is a variable cost, don't have a good sense about fixed cost. That's what we gave them in these problems. Very simply, they are not quite so straightforward and they struggle with it. There's nothing wrong. You have the concept. You know how to move with it. But can that be done? You're thinking about marketing and you sort of know about uh, uh, people that are early adopters and then those that adopt a little bit uh, you know, later and, and, and S curves and all that. But how do I really go use that and figure that out uh, in, 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 uh, in a real context? And what should I be thinking about? So doing scale. Even worse was the concern that when it came to issues like teams and leadership, a significant concern on the part of executives that our students had no ability to give at a very basic level. And this was, of course, just coming from them as, you know, I was trying to say, okay, give me the most basic stuff of doing skills that they don't have. And they said, to give anyone performance feedback. Because when you're working in a team, you know, people sometimes perform, don't perform, and you're trying to figure out how should I give someone feedback on this activity, on what they've done? And they said, each time when I look at your students, they have no clue either how to give or to take, receive feedback in a, in a way that is helpful, constructive, positive, frank, honest, you know, the whole thing. And of course, we understand that to be a very difficult task. It's not a straightforward task at all. But they say that's sort of like 101 for it when it comes to doing skills. And so, and then there was communication issues, there were presentation issues. Uh, and of course, then this whole area of experiential learning, which this school is so famous for, uh, was, became a very big issue. In fact, became a sufficiently big issue that we cite a lot of, of course, Professor Kolb's work and uh, go into the whole area about why this entire focus on the classroom may be a problem if we are trying to build any of these doing skills that uh, we want our students to get. And then whether it's labs and and I'll come back to some of those uh, initiatives that schools are taking. But surely the idea of doing skills uh, uh, you know, was, a, was, a, was a big concern. And then finally, we got to being. And, and each time, of course, whenever, you, whenever we go through one of these projects, there's always something that causes you to suddenly think that a particular uh, uh, issue is a very uh, major issue. And, and we hadn't really thought about being per se at that time that we were initially working on the book or on, on rethinking the MBA, but it became very clear to us uh, as we went deeper into the topic that this was very important. And the way it came to us is that we began to think, what is the basic difference between a manager, who's uh, practicing the profession of management, and a medical doctor, who's also practicing the profession of medicine? Well, if I was to ask, and then one can go, if I had more time, we could debate what those options, what the various differences were. But the one that kept coming back at us was, as we were going through these interviews and these discussions, which once it said, it's obvious, but it really highlighted for us why this is such a big deal, is that the relationship to be a success, or what you need to be a successful doctor, largely resides between your ability to interact with your patients. That's what you basically do when you're a doctor. In the case of the manager, your ability be, to be successful depends almost, what shall we say, some substantial percentage on how good people around you are. You can be the smartest person around, but if your people around you aren't inspired, aren't motivated, aren't able to do things that you want to get done. Because after all, society likes organizations and firms only because by coming together, we can achieve more for society than what we would have done if we had said, no, you can't band together and do work that firms do. So if that's what they do, then the biggest part of it was how successful a manager is depends on how good the people around that manager are. Very different from what it might be if I'm an architect or if I'm a doctor or if I'm a lawyer. So this idea about organizations and the idea that we are only successful if the people around us we make more successful became a very important part of uh, thinking about what we were going to do in the book. And the part that I'll come to that I think is the big opportunity or the area where I, I feel 
that uh, you know, business education really needs to think about things differently and comes back to the opportunity that experiential learning provides is the ability of our students to understand people who are very different from themselves. So one of the things that I certainly got very interested in and I have been continued to be interested in since the book, but I'll just mention this as an interesting, uh, uh, interesting side story is, uh, what does it really take to motivate a factory worker was one of the interesting questions that we thought we should ask. You know, if you're talking about people different from yourself, this person, they, I could ask the same question of a designer, I could ask the same question of an accountant, I could ask the same question of a salesperson, but I'll just take, for instance, what does it mean? So if I really wanted to motivate a factory worker, what would it do? And I'll tell you this experience that I had from my work in India recently, it's because I was doing the same thing, so whenever I would go, I would actually go almost stay with that worker for a little while, just to get a sense about you know, what is happening in that house, what's happening in with this place. So I'm trying to understand people who are very different from who I am, and so if I'm trying to understand that, and if our students are trying to understand that to motivate these people, how are you going to motivate it without you understanding deeply who these people are that you're leading? So if you buy the first premise, that we're only successful if the people around us are successful, then the next question is, how well do I deeply understand uh, these folks? And so, I, you know, thanks to some of the work that uh, Fred and I have been doing together, of course, I was very interested in innovation. I said, let me combine these two. So I went to these number of these visits in, in India, and I asked some of these uh, factory workers, I said, you know, is there a, any way, because when you're talking innovatively, you want to think about stretch things, you know, not just an incremental thing. I said, is there any way you can give me 12 hours of work for eight hours of pay? Eight hours of work for eight hours of pay would be good, but you know, since I want to think out of the box, I want to think innovatively, I said 12 hours of work for eight hours of pay. And let me leave that question in the room for a moment. Do you think I got any answer in this group? And I've now tried this now many times because after the first person told me what he told me, I said, this is interesting. I want to explore this a little more with a lot of other people. Any shot, do you think? that a factory worker in India, and this happens to be in the Indian context, but you can imagine it here, would give you 12 hours of work for eight hours of pay. Any chance? Why? Helping the community, doing something that would help their children. And that is exactly what the person told me. He said, I've got a future on the factory floor. <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> you got a future on the factory floor. But it, is, it, is, it was unbelievable, actually, how this first time it happened. And so, you know, the first standard thing is that you, of course, think about the factory worker, and you think about uh, this factory worker. You say, you know, improve the working conditions. And he said, you know, I'd give you eight hours for that, but, you know, I expect that my working conditions would be, would be good. But then he said, can I be brutally honest with you? I said, absolutely. And he said, Tell me what happens when your son or daughter struggles in school. So I said, you know, that's uh, pretty simple. I'll first drop everything to make sure that my son or daughter doesn't continue to slide in school. You know, this is a big deal. I'll make sure that I get it done immediately. I will make sure that uh, I'll find a friend, you know, if I can't do it. I'll go some physics question that they don't understand. I have some few uh, friends who know physics better than I do. I'll go ask them. And if that doesn't work, then I'll go to the internet. I'll probably do many of these things simultaneously, see can I get some other resources. And if all that doesn't work, I'll hire a tutor. You know, those would be my options. He said, do you realize that all the four things you said I can't do? I don't have friends. Can, I can't tutor, I'm not educated enough to do it. I don't have friends who, like you have, who can help. I certainly don't know how to find resources on the internet in a way that you can, and I certainly don't have access to tutors. Even if I had, I wouldn't know who's good and who's not. Then he looked at me, he says, look, all these buildings after five o'clock are lying empty. There are lots of conference rooms here, they're all lying empty. No one's using this after five o'clock. What if? management understanding what 
I am going through. He says, my career is over. I'm not going to be able to do a thing. I don't want my kid to fight this unequal battle, he said, with yours. That's what I'm being brutally honest, he said, with you. I don't like people like you for that reason. Because you make it a very unequal battle for me versus my kid, for, you, for your kid versus my kid. But at much lower cost, if you put tutors in these rooms, let's say in the evenings, because I don't know how to find them, and you could figure out how to do it. And if these folks were able to help my children when they needed help, I'll go through walls for that. I'll give you 12 hours of work for eight hours of pay. Because you now really understand what is meaningful and important to me. Because otherwise, you give me a little more money, you give me this, but that's not the main thing. Main thing I'm looking for is that. And I've tested this out now repeatedly, and every time it comes back to the same thing. And maybe the situation in India is a little bit more stronger on this dimension than it might be elsewhere. But I'd hazard a guess that it would apply in very many different other contexts as well. But it's your ability to deeply understand something. And by the way, the same thing applies in marketing. Your ability to deeply understand what the customer cares about. Of course, we would now say in the, in the, in the jobs way of thinking about it, even before the customer knows about it. But at least let's first figure out what you, know, you can really understand with respect to what they want. And so being became a very big deal for us. And how poorly we were doing with respect to that aspect, if in fact this is an important part of what it means to lead, if this is an important part of what it means to be entrepreneurial, if this is an important part of how organizations function, then we were certainly not doing a very good job on that dimension. So with those three, let me just take couple of examples in each case. I've already gone through the thinking skills. I've already talked about, uh, Sorry, go ahead. Corporation, which the which which would people would which at least the worker was telling me compared to what you pay me, it'll be much less even than a cost than what you ordinarily give me you know, in terms of this bonus or that bonus because I can't do with it what I want. And this would be less costly for you to do and much more motivating for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 No. No, not at all. Not at all. But I am suggesting that it's very important for us to understand what it, and I'm not even sure that you'll get 12 hours every time, but I'm just saying I pose the question in a way to get that thing because it forces you to rotate your attention to an area that you may not have even thought about. So maybe one corporation is doing it but there are a large number of others that are not, and it's surely not the only way. Point is, how well do our students, and, and the, the issue that I ask is, I think there are a certain things that can only happen, by the way, while you're a student. This is very hard for a person in a company to do, really trying to understand what this, what people have all sorts of motivations about why you're doing this, and what's your uh, rationale for doing it. So I am suggesting that, if in the process of experiential learning and other things that we try to do, if our students were able to interact with people that they are going to lead. Yeah. Yeah. But he won't know how to find it. That's what this person was saying. He says, I can't, he can't find it. I can't do this. Even the money that you give me is not, I'm not able to, uh, I, I'm not able to understand who is a good tutor. I'm not able to understand how to find a tutor. I'm not able to understand. He said, those steps, each one of us having to do, 50 workers having to do this step, or 100 workers having to do, 1,000 workers, it's just like too complicated. That was the point. I mean, I'm not saying that it is the only, Solution. It is. It was his way of trying to demonstrate what, in fact, might be a productive uh, way for us to think about what their needs are and what might motivate them more than other mechanisms that we might have used up to this point. I'm not suggesting it's the only one, by no means. So, and then of course, on each of these things, which I'll, I'll just uh, pick up on. Uh, 
I, I've already made the last point that I wanted to make, which is, you know, the f intense focus on knowing is, is important and good, but without doing skills, knowing is of little value. And if you want to get things done through others, which is what I was arguing we really need to worry about, then unless you basically understand being, uh, you know, the whole way in which we're thinking about management education uh, appears to me to be somewhat incomplete. So it's not at the, the fact that you don't have to do knowing. Of course we have to do that. Of course we have to keep building the knowledge base that we have, but the question is one of how do you get the balance uh, right? And I think the challenge in all of this, which is why, I, as I said, I, I'm eager to learn how you folks have done it here. The challenge in all of this is uh, the ability on the parts of schools, faculties, whatever, to appreciate all dimensions of this problem. So it's not only one or only the other. It's very different things that would need to be done. And so how do we get faculties and uh, schools to think about all dimensions of this problem in a way that we can go about uh, addressing it? Let me go into details on two or three and then uh, uh, take some more questions from you. So the one I want to just uh, talk a little bit about is, the, is what Stanford ended up doing. By the way, when I go to those thinking skills, whichever ones you decide are worth uh, doing, uh, my sense is the schools that have had the most uh, success with those are ones that have done that, one, done these kinds of skills early in the program. So the problem with doing it late in the program is that it doesn't give you an opportunity to repeatedly practice it. So what Stanford does in its uh, new curriculum is it does the thinking critically and, and the critical thinking skills called critical analytical thinking is the course title early in the program, first semester. Soon as you come in, you're going to do this. You're going to practice it a few times so that when you get into subsequent courses, you have the opportunity to practice it again and again. If you said you wanted to do innovative thinking as a major thing that you want to do, then there are lots of opportunities to practice it, but then do it early. Doing it at the end doesn't give students the opportunity to practice it. As I'll come back to uh, describing a little later on, some of these skills only come from repeated practice. They are not one of those that you can just hear a lecture on and it gets done. You've got to actually work with it, play with it, uh, practice it. And so Stanford does it very early. Their particular goal was how do you develop an articulate, logical, coherent, and persuasive arguments? How do you marshal supporting evidence? And how do you distinguish fact from opinion? So that was their goal. And by the way, there are other schools that have, in their critical thinking courses, added things like biases that people have in the way in which they make decisions and biases that show up in teams. And you can do many things with a course like that. But uh, uh, I'll just present what uh, they do. As I said, required first quarter course. Every student at Stanford must go through this course. Taught in seminar format, 14 to 16 students, one tenure line faculty member, plus in some cases a practitioner or an adjunct. Weekly cycle, students read and write. And the very interesting thing about this particular course, which uh, uh, we've certainly found to be valuable in terms of what they were trying to get done was the forcing students to write part. Now, you know, you know, case discussions and all are fine, but then you're just, you're not sort of developing the whole argument from beginning to end. So what a, what a course like critical analytical thinking does is you know, for students to do the writing, uh, uh, to uh, think through the whole set of arguments. I'll, let me just finish and then see if you have any questions. They finished this thing on late Wednesday. This is the interesting part of what they do. And again, not necessarily the only way. Graded on Thursday with a seminar discussion on Friday. So the instructor, when they come into the room, already knows all the arguments that each of these 14 folks have made on a particular topic. I'll present the topics to you in a, in a minute. And of course, they're looking for why people made different arguments and thought through the issues in different ways. What were the assumptions that they made? What did you, how did you argue it through? What was the logic that you used? Seven such cycles in the year we studied it. It's uh, five or six now, some, something like that. Papers are graded by a writing coach for style and instructors for content. Again, one can debate whether you want to do all of this or not. Here are the, some of the topics that they talked about. Should Google stay in China with Google.cn? We already know what the issues are around that, but how do you think it through? 
Should K-12 education be publicly provided and publicly financed? When should you have rules in organizations and when should you have discretion? This was right around the Abu Ghraib uh, issues, so they talked about it in the context of torture, but you can think about it in the context of key employee retention. So when an employee comes to you, do you apply a rule, do you apply discretion? No right answers, but what were they trying to uh, get at? Most cases require truths that the students don't yet have. They don't understand all these issues at this point. How do you attack questions? If you were going to use deductive arguments to come to your conclusion, what kind of, how do you build good deductive arguments? And there's one particular first session only on deductive arguments. Then if you were to use causative reasoning, second session, the problem is one on applying causative reasoning. Third, inductive arguments. How do you uh, uh, induce things from observations? When do you use analogy? So they just go through in each first sessions are each one to develop how do you think using each of these reasoning tools. Then you have general things where you don't, you have to figure out which of these various approaches you should use in a particular situation or context. So how do you reason and argue? How do you read and listen critically? How do you present your arguments, clarity and soundness rather than persuasion? So just an interesting way, various elements of it that I would highlight done early, forcing people to write because that forces you to think more clearly and then debating and discussing what the different points of view are, I think are essential elements of this course, but very different kinds of things than what we have seen typically in business school courses, but required first term. I won't go through too much of this integration skills. There have been two ways in which this has been done, and I know you do some things in your uh, courses here, uh, Fred, your, the course that I saw where you're trying to get people to look at integratively what is happening was one such example. But here, uh, the example I was going to cite is, and, and I won't go through the thing, just the elements of it. How do you look at a problem from shifting frames and in a holistic way? How do you look at conflicting functional perspectives? And how do you build judgment and intuition into messy, unstructured <coughs> situations? And I think an interesting approach here is, ra there have been two approaches that have been taken. One approach that I think is here is, the, is what Yale took, which by the way at this point I think a substantial part of it has been undone actually. It's not been one that has stayed in the, in the, in it, in the form in which it was. Which was, at that time they said rather than look at it in functions, let's look at it in terms of the various perspectives. So when you're in externally, what are you looking at? You're looking at a competitor perspective, a customer perspective, an investor perspective, a state and society perspective. So how do you look at these perspectives? And then it cuts across a large number of the functions that we had. That was the approach they took. And then there are internal perspectives, employees, uh, innovators, operations engines, sourcing and managing of funds. And of course, you can probably tie in a particular course to it. So the customer course obviously has more marketing in it than anything else. But they bring in the accounting perspective, they bring in the OB perspective, they bring in politics and regulation perspective and the operations perspective. So multiple faculty would teach each of these courses, so a little bit harder to schedule if your program's very big. Uh, but that was one approach. Well, why do you think you all backed away from this? I think very, uh, from what I understand, very hard to implement and execute, uh, getting a lot of the faculty to you know, do this in a, in a truly integrative way. Yeah, teaching is easy unless you have to have faculty get together. Unless you have to have faculty get together. Uh, but, but let me say that the, 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 the approach that certainly, and I'll just speak for myself, not for David or Patrick, that I thought was, a, was quite interesting was a different approach, which is how do you, think about integrative thinking as a more of a meta skill. So just like you were thinking of critical thinking, how do you think of integrative thinking? So the Rotman School tries to do this and has continued to, uh, to push it in a, in a significant way, where the basic idea is how do you take two completely conflicting ideas and be willing to listen to both ideas and figure out what might be a good solution. So that's the basic approach that Rotman takes to integrative thinking. So you might ask, you know, do you want to take a shareholder perspective or a stakeholder perspective? And there are elements of both that you want to think about. And how might you go about thinking about it? Do you 
want to empower people a lot or do you want to control? And you can imagine that there are ways in which you might think about both those issues. Do you want to look at intrinsic motivation or extrinsic motivation and where are ways in which you do it? And of course, you could do it across operations and marketing and across the functional areas as well. But their approach was to try and do it as a little more of a meta skill rather than do it in a course with team teaching along the lines that Yale did. So they took two different approaches. The Rotman one continues and the Yale one at this point I believe is uh, much less. I mean they might still do a little bit of it uh, to your question but nothing to the extent that it was done in the past. Okay. Any questions? Let me go to a couple of the doing skills so that we have a little bit of time for more uh, questions at the end. Uh, and if there was one thing that we heard repeatedly from a lot of these executives, it was that your students might be very good in functions, they might be very good in analysis, they might be very good in frameworks, but when it comes to thinking innovatively, and creatively, they didn't think that our students were very good across the, across the whole group of them. There might be individual students who are fantastic at it, but as a group, they didn't think that we were doing very much to do this. And this was this idea about finding and framing problems. You, I mean, even a case, the person who has found and framed the problem is who? When a student analyzes the case, who finds and frames the problem? The faculty member, the instructor, I've already framed the problem. I looked at a whole lot of messy stuff and decided that of all the things I was going to write about, that's what the case was going to be about. But they don't do that. Then I give them enough information that they can look at a few alternatives. They have to stay within those alternatives. So obviously, even the case method will not help to do uh, problem finding and problem framing. No collecting and distilling large volumes of ambiguous data. That's what businesses are worried about. Should I go into this particular market? How would you go about doing that? It's not in a nice form in the case. You know, look at these few facts and now here are the two alternatives and choose one of them. That's not how most of these business problems show up. Uh, generative and lateral thinking, coming up with new ideas and constantly experimenting and learning. Now, of course, you folks in the whole areas of design thinking have done an amazing amount of work in this uh, in this area. And if one thinks about what the challenges would be, and I won't go through all the uh, various things, the, the, the school we cited in the book, of course, at that time was the Stanford Design School. This is a school that is, of course, promotes a lot of design thinking. But I think the main goal of the Stanford uh, Design School course, and I think the main goal of the course that uh, uh, Fred and others teach here is this notion that you're going to have to have, there are certain approaches and techniques that one can use to stimulate more creativity and to stimulate more uh, uh, creative thinking. But at the end of the day, it's going to come from repeated practice. So as we say in the book, you know, these kinds of skills, again, if I now combine what happens with the skills I'm trying to develop and the pedagogies that we use, will require very different pedagogies than the ones that uh, we are used to. In fact, just today as I, as I speak here uh, at the Harvard Business School, we're opening up the innovation lab for the first time. It's the first time we have created space that is not a tiered standard Harvard Business School case discussion classroom. Because as I joked with my faculty colleagues, you know, if uh, I know I, we all being a Harvard Business School professor, you naturally love teaching by the case method, and of course we have a great time doing it. But you know, if I was going to teach my kids swimming, I would not do it by the case method. You know, I wouldn't be saying, you know, go talk to someone and find out how to use swim and how to use swim. You put them in the pool, you make them kick their feet in a particular way and hands in a particular way, you correct them as they're doing it, and you keep they keep learning. So it seems to me that, and of course, Fortunately, we have uh, at Harvard Business School too uh, picked up on this and the new design of the curriculum is, uh, is going after many of these things, not the standard way in which we would do it. It has to come from repeated practice. It has to come from experiencing it. It has to come from uh, actually being in the pool and it shouldn't be the case that we have to think that everything that is worth teaching in business education will fit the case method, just like everything in business education won't fit the lecture method, just like everything in business education won't fit the experiential method. So 
one should be very eclectic about the kind of pedagogical approaches we use, but we haven't been that eclectic in business education on the kinds of pedagogical approaches we use. We're much more comfortable with some than we are with others. And so the question is, uh, uh, what would it be? So here's what the Stanford Design School does, and I believe it's very much what uh, you do. It's not a single school student, but multiple school students. So in the Stanford case, you get it. But some sense of diversity. I don't want to necessarily say it has to be multiple schools, but some element of diversity in innovative thinking is helpful. Not individuals, but teams. Not a professor, but teaching teams. Not lectures and assignments, but exercises and projects. Not analytical problem solving, but emergent problem solving. Try it, see how it works. If it doesn't work, uh, figure out a solution. Not thinking and debating a lot, which is what we tend to typically do, but doing and debriefing. Try it, see what, it, what happens, where do you go with it. Not avoiding failure, but in fact, the idea that sometimes when you're thinking innovatively, you want to fail fast so that you learn quicker. Not rigorous analysis, waiting to make sure that by the time I finish, everything is nicely, properly baked. Rigorous testing. So these are very opposite ideas that for us sometimes is very uncomfortable but one that uh, I think becomes very important in the context of if we are going to get uh, innovative uh, people. And then the next question that I think has come up many times in the course of this work is, OK, Shrikant, you know, but do our students need to do innovative thinking? Should they be practiced in or steeped in innovative thinking? Can't they just manage? Because after all, they're going to just be managers, they don't have to actually do it, they can just manage it. You know, they just are going to manage innovation. So our focus should be on managing innovation, not on teaching them how to be innovative themselves. And this was, of course, a legitimate question that gets raised, and it's one that uh, I think deserves some amount of consideration as to whether, in fact, that's what it is. But I have to say that after having studied this now for the last six, seven months, again, I'll give you my personal view, not, not uh, all of us, of course, didn't think about it in the context of it at the time of the book. But I definitely have come to the conclusion that it's very difficult for an organization or a company to be innovative unless the leader is at least innovatively minded. I don't care whatever else is going to. And you, it's very hard for you to be innovatively minded unless you fully appreciate what this innovation process is. Because it's a very different process than the one that we typically like to you know, do from a very systematic, analyze it, figure it out, develop it in a particular way model. Now, this is not to say that you won't constantly go back and forth between these two, between being innovative and then trying to you know, narrow it down. It's not like you're uh, only focusing on one part and not the other. But unless you are innovatively minded, unless you appreciate that this process is very different, you're likely to want to cut it down because it's messy, it's difficult, it's complicated to do. And so at least my view at this point is that if you want to create leaders who are likely to be innovatively minded, you've got to put them a little bit into this innovative process because it's very hard to appreciate it from the outside. It's one of those that you have to be inside to learn what it is. And that, I think, is going to be the challenge or the issue for us. That uh, it's not that I want to make these guys great innovators. That's not what it's going to be. But at least if I've done it, I have an appreciation of what that whole process is and the challenges with that whole process are, and the excitement, frankly, of that whole process so that I'm more likely to be innovatively minded. So that's at least where I am on, on that issue. Let me make a couple other observations on uh, and of course, again, experiential learning can be a huge uh, 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 benefit here because if I'm actually trying to put people into situations, I can be very creative about the kinds of problems I will ask them to work on so that they will be much more uh, 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 working on more innovation kinds of issues. But let me, and I won't go through this whole experiential learning thing. You've done it, of course, in spades over here. And as I said, we cite Professor Kolb's work uh, quite extensively in the book. Let me go to the last part of what I want to just touch upon and then uh, uh, take uh, uh, questions that you might have. I've already said uh, uh, things about leadership, but it typically has been done in three different ways. And I just want to 
highlight those three approaches to developing leadership skills. So one issue is understanding the purpose of business and the responsibilities of leadership. So if I think about the knowing, it's the what. If I think about the doing, it's the how. If I think about being, it's the why. And so one aspect of it is clearly that. And this is likely to be a very, uh, it's going to be an area that I think will be debated a lot. So what exactly is the role of the corporation? Should one, and you know, I know in this school, tremendous amount of effort in the area of sustainability. And yet, as you sort of look at what's going on, some amount of concern about how much should we focus, should corporations and businesses focus on those issues compared to, you know, trying to win at all costs, you know, that kind of uh, mindset. And that's, well, that's going to be an interesting and important debate. But unless that is discussed and that is thought about and unless one un appreciates and understands that perhaps the reason people are talking about sustainability is that, in fact, it is a source of competitive advantage. It is a source of more innovation. But those are issues that we've got to discuss and debate. I don't think we're doing as much of that uh, in the context of uh, business schools at the moment. So that's one. And then, of course, this whole issue about ethics comes up in this context. Can it be taught? Should it be done by virtue of a course? Are there other approaches to doing it? Are there ways in which you can think about moral reasoning? I mean, these are, again, big issues that we'll have to at least discuss and debate, as I say. Uh, lots of schools trying to think about uh, uh, those set of questions. And then, as I discussed already, how do you inspire, influence, and guide others? What is the impact of my action on other people's behavior? Because if I'm trying to get things done through others, I have to be aware of that. How do other people react about their own actions and about their own uh, ways of behaving when they're with me. So these are very important uh, impacts. And I don't think this whole point, the last point that I want to come to, this whole thing about self-awareness, uh, relationship management, social awareness, these are things that I think as I've looked at what's happened in, the, in terms of the changes that are occurring in business schools, people are recognizing to be very important. They are not nice to have and so on. First order importance because when you go into an organization, unless these things are, are made of and so here I'm talking about things like leadership lab. So I think this whole area of leadership development will range from things that we'll do in the classroom, like the, some of the topics that I talked about at the start, things that we'll debate about as to how best do we do things like ethics and uh, you know very interesting sets of uh, issues about how do we go about doing that. Things that we'll do in labs because people, you know, you, how do you give feedback to individuals about how they're acting, how they're behaving, what they're doing, what, and you never get a good sense about that until someone actually tells you about these things and a great opportunity to do it while we are in school. Uh, uh, you know, we uh, eventually studied the Center for Creative Leadership to look at some of these things and the only reason we really went there is because uh, two things. One is since 1970, they have looked at about 400,000 such observations. So they had a lot more data than any other institution that we were aware of. And second, we were really interested in their, when we went and talked to them, that they said their job was to put back on track derailed careers. These are very, very smart people who simply didn't understand what it means to lead, simply didn't understand what it means to work with others, simply didn't understand the impact their actions have on others, and they were coming to them just to put back their derailed careers. And so they said, you know, if you folks can do something in business schools, at least we don't have to have them derailed and then put back on the rails. They can uh, perhaps stay on the rails a little longer. But of course, that's another debate. Can you actually do it early enough versus should you actually wait for it to be, wait to happen? Again, I think by and large our view was on many of these things that, uh, uh, there are some significant opportunities early on. And then, of course, the last element of leadership development that I've already touched upon is experiential learning. And how do I, from a point of view of motivating my students, get them to think about understanding the people they're going to lead? Because do they just make a bunch of assumptions about it? Do they deeply understand it? Do we give them the opportunity to understand it? And now if I extend that to global, 
which sort of cuts across all these things, that problem just gets increased a whole lot more. How do you really sensitize them to a global, uh, to the to uh, global issues, both in terms of the frameworks that you got to think about, in terms of the differences that exist on either economic, cultural, geographical, administrative differences across countries, cultures that are different in how people work and how you get things done. So. This, if global is a very big issue, which it clearly seems to be for many business schools, these issues become even amplified a lot more as I think about what the implications might be for, uh, uh, from, a, from a global context. So just to wrap up, uh, I come back to uh, you know, know, do, and be. Uh, and to summarize again, knowledge Good, I think if I was to sort of grade at this point, knowledge good, but uh, um, not enough in terms of good thinking skills from what we heard. Doing weak and the ability to execute, get things done, uh, think innovatively, uh, poor, and in part I think because of the fact that the identity self-awareness piece is something that we have not paid nearly as much attention to in business schools as we should. And so uh, uh, this notion that we definitely, and I sometimes get this question, do you, are you saying that all the business school research that we're doing, we should shut down? And I say, absolutely not. Now, nowhere in the book and would I ever say that that's my position. But I would say that the idea that there's only one style of research that might be done or one type of course that might be done or one type of thing, that's a very dangerous notion, I believe, for us to cling to for too long and maybe in part how do we get that uh, balance right uh, is, in fact, a very big question for many faculties and for us uh, together. But I think if we are going to retain our relevance, if we are going to uh, thrive, which I'm optimistic that we will do, then these are the sets of issues. By the way, the research questions in each of these areas are profound and as interesting, if not more interesting, than the research questions we have grappled with up to now. So, if I think about innovation, how do I think about what innovative teams are? How do I think about who innovative people are? How will I identify who these folks are? How will I manage innovation in that way? If I think through leadership development, a whole set of questions that I can ask on those. So it's not as though the research questions are any less interesting in those areas, but they are different than the kinds of questions I think that we have asked up to now. And those might be interesting opportunities, I think, for faculties and for us as a profession to uh, engage with. So let me stop at that point uh, and open it up for questions, comments, criticisms, corrections that uh, you would want to make. Yes, ma'am. Um, as, as I'm listening to you, I, I'm struck by the fact that the academy knows that management science has deep and thirsty roots in more classical disciplines like philosophy, anthropology, sociology, psychology, biology, neuroscience, et cetera, right? But traditionally, management education has pretended that those linkages don't exist. But it sounds like Stanford, the example that you gave at least, is giving a nod to the fact that the way those disciplines teach their own people may actually be something we need to borrow and learn from. Uh, is that a solitary example? Is that, are there others no, no. where we could be making those linkages more clear? No, I think that's a very good point, and I don't think that's a solitary example by any means. It's, of course, the most uh, celebrated example, for sure, just because of the stature of the school and the, uh, and the uh, emphasis on some of the other factors that you were thinking about and their ability to see that there is, in fact, uh, opportunity here that is uh, tremendous and, and valuable. Uh, but you're seeing this now more and more across uh, uh, other schools. And, and I, I think from a uh, uh, you know, faculty development standpoint, because that automatically, your question automatically goes into that, I, I often uh, uh, you know, only half jokingly say the following. I say, you know, there's absolutely fantastic that in our early years when we are doing our Think that you have to think very rigorously, deeply, and by nature, your problems are going to be narrower as a result. You know, if you're trying to do that, you're 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 going to do work of that nature. I think the problem is that as one gets to be a little more senior and develops, and you could imagine that happening even at the at an assistant professor level, is there a willingness on the part of schools, on the part of faculty, on the part of academy to 
sort of allow a broadening out of some of these dimensions that you are referring to. And I mean, one would like it at all levels, but I would hope that at least the leaders in the profession start thinking about it along those lines. And until the leaders start, that's why I just say Stanford. But Wharton's doing very similar things. Berkeley is doing very similar things. So I can cite, uh, uh, you know, Harvard for a long time already did this. So we were, uh, we are somewhat, uh, uh, you know, lucky, insulated, however you want to say, because you know we have a large number of our colleagues who do very broad, very good work. But it would not be of this very. Uh, you know, detailed type that gets into the academic journals. And we've always celebrated a faculty that has that kind of diversity. So, uh, but there are many other schools, I think, that are doing it. So I don't think it's isolated. It's coming from some of the challenges that I was describing earlier. So not isolated at all. So you already sort of hinted a little bit at what I was going to ask about, but uh, I'm really keen to hear your thoughts on what you think are the reasons why business schools and management schools as an industry are where they are and why have we missed it? We are supposed to be teaching others how to do business. No, it's a very, it's a very, good, uh, very good question. And I think uh, uh, you would hope that, I mean, and the reasons are clear as to why we miss it. So let me, the, the reasons that, I, that we outline in the book and the reasons that I was alluding to are clear. That there is a very well-defined form of scholarship that we think is, uh, is a well-established form. And that over from you know, where it was in the 60s to where it came now is just fantastic. But continuing to do more of that and only that, I think, is problematic. And you know, whenever you've got to make a, a different switch, businesses miss it, and you know, we, can, we can miss it too, because it's, uh, it's easy to miss. It's not so. Uh, uh, it's not so obvious. I was mentioning to uh, Dean Mohan a little bit earlier that when I was doing this presentation to a group of uh, uh, deans at the AACSB meeting, and you know, I was thinking that I'm going to say all of this, and this is somewhat of a fairly strong criticism of what they have done, and you know, uh, I wasn't getting any kind of a negative reaction. So, you know, I was getting harsher and still getting no negative reaction. I was getting harsher still and still no negative reaction. So I'm wondering what's going on until after the seminar finished. They said, you know, the problem is where you're sitting. You don't know if this is a problem only for you or is it a problem across everybody. You know, you're seeing enrollments go down, for instance, you know, the data I was presenting. Where you're sitting, you think, is this a problem unique to me? You know, my school, my situation, my town, my this is causing this to go down. But everybody else is just fine. So when you look at the entire data and you say, no, everybody is swimming in the somewhat uh, difficult waters, you become much more aware that this is, in fact, a much more generic problem. So for each individual school to appreciate that they're actually doing it and need to do something different and the ability to do it, it's, again, not so easy. So the second reason I'd give you is that none of these are easy things to do. It's not like, you know, I can just immediately do it. I mean, I, I'm very eager to hear through the course of the day how this school has managed to be so bold as to try so many different things. You know, if I look at what's happened in experiential learning, look at what's happened in leadership, look at what's happened in innovative thinking, you know, it's just amazing as to how some of these things have happened at, uh, at Weatherhead. But it's not a snap. And I'm sure even here there's this journey that you're on in terms of trying to figure it out. So those two together, the fact that you know, it is a comfortable way of proceeding and it's not so like the frog in boiling water kind of syndrome. You know, you don't jump out so, so quickly and it is a comfortable way of proceeding. It's only when it starts going down that you do it. And then the change is not so easy. And part of what we're trying to do at least is figure out how do we do things more collectively that might actually help at least in the initial stages of trying to get some of these things launched because you know, much like what Ford Foundation and Carnegie Corporation did in the 60s. They got a group of people together, said, okay, if we're going to teach differently, how are we going to do it? So it's going to require this, you know, it's not a snap, and the third point I'd make is going to require a community in some form to work together to get it done. So those are my reactions. I was just curious um, about the, the composition of your, your deficit when you're showing the, uh, the enrollment numbers. How much of that were employee sponsored versus um, students that actually just from for the MBA program? Yeah. And, and the reason why I bring that up is um, coming from the corporate sector, some trends that I'm noticing. Um, 
such as, um, of course, there is law employee um, loyalty right now, your life. Uh, so those long-term investments that companies would make in employees is no longer there. Then there's the other aspect of uh, mostly Fortune 1000 companies setting up their own quote-unquote universities internally. Mm -hmm. Um, and partnering with universities to offer MBA courses but with certifications granted internally within the Correct. company. Correct. Uh, so using CBTs or other forms. Mm -hmm. And then um, the last point, and this came from when I observed, when, when I knew about this, and I observed <coughs> the application trends for further training within the, the organization. And I realized that um, for those that wanted to go for postgraduate studies, when you give them the option of MBA, they would bypass that because they would have to go through a second layer of <coughs> interviews for them to be qualified to go for the MBA. Mm -hmm. So they thought, when I asked them, they thought it would make more sense for them to go for relevant postgraduate courses, like a master's in project management mm -hmm. or a master's in engineering management, but to bypass the MBA so they're not seen exclusively as well to go into management, mm -hmm. but they would like something that's more relevant to so that's in terms of the MBA. I just wanted to know your yeah. Yes. No, I, I mean all of those are uh, so this rise of substitutes, as we refer to it in the book, are all events that are occurring for all the reasons that you're describing. Uh, you know, most of our look at the full-time MBA, of course, is not company-sponsored. Very little of it is company-sponsored. So these are people actually voting with their feet as to whether they want to, you know, pay for this uh, education or not. What we are finding now is that companies are getting more particular about how many they want to sponsor for all the reasons that you're describing. So, you know, are people staying with us after they do it? Are we getting a return on this investment or not? You know, all those questions are, are, are uh, coming up. And as, you know, the economy has been a little bit, uh, 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 you know, uh, under pressure, companies are just not wanting to sponsor nearly as much. So we're seeing that effect come up quite strongly in the last two years, post the book, but we've just been continuing to track the data, that effect continues to be a very big challenge. And so you will find, I believe, unless we can say that we are giving you not a very, just a general management knowledge thing, but they feel that they're getting skills that are very valuable to them. When it comes to the company, they actually want even more of that, uh, you know, than we do. I think you've got to be careful not to go overboard in terms of trying to only respond to recruiter demands. I think that's a very dangerous thing for us to do as well. But uh, I think the challenges right now are, uh, are so great that unless you are able to do that to at least more greater extent than what we're doing, they just don't feel there's any return in sending people. So they will send people to project management, shorter thing, much more directly related to what they're doing. And so part of what we're seeing is all of those forces coming together in the challenges that is being posed to business education just now. I'm, I'm perplexed by um, the perpetual nature of this challenge. We did what you're saying should be done in 1990 to 95. Shifted, we went from being nowhere on the map to being the most benchmarked MBA program in the country. We, uh, what we were doing innovatively inspired Len Schlesinger's committee at the Thank business school you. and the competency work and the Thank values. You. Um, you know, and we're sitting on 25 years of longitudinal data showing it works. We, we actually have the technology, the pedagogy to develop primarily the skills, the doing and the being parts of it. And yet, if we mapped where we were, yeah on your initial chart of 2000 to 2008, yeah. we dropped somewhere between 46 and 60 percent full-time enrollment, depending upon how you count our Budapest <coughs> students. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm struck by this dilemma that, for, for, and, and we did it in, in, in the title of chapter 10 in our 1995 book that Scott Cowan and Dave Colvin I wrote, yeah. was called What If Learning Were the Purpose of Education? Because yeah. we said the framework yeah. was we have to change our context from teaching to learning. Yeah. We have to think, Absolutely. what are the students getting? Absolutely. What are they hanging on to? Yeah. So the thing that ends up being a bit perplexing um, is, for us, from our self-study, is what happened? You know, kind of, how did we go from being in the top 30 to, you know, being in the 
bottom part of the top 50. Um, how did we go from being leaders in the industry on these things, which everybody cited at the time, yeah. to uh, not even being benchmarked on current surveys? Is it the issue that Clay raised in his book on innovations in universities that no matter what you're doing, you've got to do something dramatically different every so many years? Um. I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very perplexing, as you say, it is a very perplexing question. I mean, I'd have two reactions to it. Uh, uh, one that, uh, you know, these, yeah, you've done it uh, for a long enough time, but when you've done it uh, uh, all by yourself, it sort of like uh, uh, doesn't feel as if, is it just, a, you know, the, the obvious thing that people say is just a fad, you know, someone's trying to do something, it's like, you know, it's done by some fantastically highly respected folks, so it may feel less like it to most of us who are aware of it, but for the general population, you know, who knows, and how, so the, the data you'll get from this will be slower to come by, I mean, I think, I just think that it's not so easy to, measure. we tried to whenever we could, any of these things whenever we were writing about in the book, we tried to go back to some of the recruiters and ask, you know, okay, this person is saying that thing, do you see any difference in how they think integratively if you're doing that? Or do you see any difference if you're doing things innovatively and what does it say? And you know, you get a, some reaction from it, but it's by no means, you know, sharp and this precise and, uh, but I think the longer cycle uh, period of these things will come when over a period of time as, as and, and, and again, I think it's also a little bit of, uh, 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 you know, getting some critical mass behind it and just thinking about, because that's one set of approaches. You know, as I've looked at all the curriculum, for instance, that I've looked at in, that uh, Fr uh, Fred sent me on what you have, and I've looked at what other people have done, you know, there are very different things that are going on. And somehow if we can, you know, just like all these other fields develop because a number of us were involved in it and were developing it, you know, maybe that then brings us to a level of, uh, uh, depth and understanding of these issues that will be more sustaining. So I, but I, I know, I mean, from a, uh, from a, a communication standpoint, trying to do this thing, I, I would say very much stay the course. Then how would you account for the fact that, according to the Financial Times, two years ago, 87,000 people were enrolled in online, not hybrid, online yeah. MBA programs, yeah. you know, which is almost the entire market that we had in the early 90s in yeah. North America. Yeah. I mean, where, where does these online programs fit in? Because they're not specialties anymore. Yeah, but I think, uh, uh, you know, again, and it, 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 uh, uh, it's a very interesting question about uh, how many segments do we have in this MBA marketplace? You know, it's, as I was arguing already that perhaps there's already one segment. I mean, if I, if I didn't care about where my students were going and I cared only about placement, let's say, then I think the top schools probably can say they don't need to change very much. You know, they're going to get uh, they're going to get very good placement because unless those industries collapse. Now that's uh, become a bit of a problem because when the financial services industry collapses, now you are running into a different problem, and now you got to think about it. But I'm saying, supposing that weren't the case, even though we as a faculty were unhappy about that many people going in, and I'd say this is probably true based on our interviews with a large number of the other schools. It is what it is, you know, you're not going to fight what the differences are, and so uh, people would go there. Then you've got the next segment, which is, they're not going into these markets, they're going into different places, and perhaps their needs are very different. They need to be much more aware of the kinds of things that we're talking about, leading people, leading teams, uh, being more entrepreneurial, being more innovative. That's what they've got to do a lot more of than if I'm being purely analytic. And then is there then a different segment that just needs, they're not going to be these kinds of leaders and so on, uh, but are, are people who just need to understand the language of business. They just need to, you know, just uh, 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 given where they have come from, this is a economic way for them to get at that kind of thing, and there very well could be. So my argue, my argue I'm getting increasingly convinced that uh, unlike other professions, ours is much more segmented, that in somehow and we don't understand those segments very well. By the way, it also then does suggest that very often what happens is that uh, people have been looking at the top schools to figure out what they should be doing. By the way, that might be the completely the wrong model. If in fact this argument about segments is correct, 
unless you're going to send people into this segment, which you may never get the opportunity to send for reasons that are outside our control, uh, to copy those folks might be a terrible idea, and lots of schools are trying to do that as well. So given that, actually that's, that's very engaging, I, I appreciate that insight. So given that, that's why medical schools don't have to worry about complete online medical school. Correct. Correct. Because nobody just wants to learn the language of Correct. medicine. Correct. Correct. Because uh, no matter... But because no matter where you go, the relative, the kind of work that you do requires all of that. But in our case, not so clear. I, I would contend that one of the dilemmas is our problem of assessment. Yeah. <coughs> you know, you, I mean, yeah, yeah. Yeah, my yeah. firm had helped your school yes. when you dropped the GMAT yes. Um, yes. to come up with alternatives. Yeah. And, and, I, and I think about this whole issue with testing, and a number of us have talked about it in the EMBA, yeah. that uh, when my friend who wrote about the making of a chef described yeah. You know, what happens when, in this one-year Culinary Institute of America, the yeah. students are learning to do soup, and the yeah. day they do Thai soup, yeah. at the end of the day, they don't get a multiple-choice question on what's in Tom Young Gun soup. They don't get a case study on three uh, patrons who tasted soup and yeah. what that really happened. Yeah. <laughs> they actually have to produce Tom Young Gun soup for six yeah. and bring it to the faculty member, yeah. and then they critique it together. Um, that use of knowledge in context yes. is something that many of us are trying to wrestle with. Yes. But that, that, that again seems like one of these assumptions we have in our methods yeah. in higher education that testing will figure out what people are learning. Yeah. But no, it doesn't. And, and, and whether we can, uh, you know, it's interesting also, of course, to see how in, uh, in certainly in the medical school tests, how they try to get at some of these issues, because you might argue, you know, each patient is different, but they do try to somehow figure out by giving you a set of circumstances where, you know, relatively speaking, you know, if you diagnose one way versus the other, you haven't really looked at all the facts and you are making a mistake. So it is, brings it into, even their exams actually try to bring it into context. And that's an interesting thing where we haven't really gone. And, how that opportunity might develop and how we ought to do it is an interesting question. So I want to respect everyone's time and thank you all. Um, let you know that Srikhan is around for the, much of the rest of the day. Uh, there's a block um, from around 3 to 4. It's pretty open. We'll hang out around 3.18. If people want to drop by for further conversation, you're welcome to do that in a small conversation. Uh, please join me now, though, in thanking Srikhan. Thank you very much. Thank you.